I want to talk a little bit about the Second Amendment. And not because I am basing my own position on gun ownership and gun rights on the Constitution. Not at all. But, I, but because I think um, that the existence of the Second Amendment is very curious, very unique, and in some ways hopeful. Uh, first of all, I said it before, I do not believe uh, that I should be required to ask anybody's permission to defend myself and my family. I love my life. I value my life over you know, all the other things that I have, and I value my loved ones, my children, my wife, even more than my own life. So for somebody to demand that I ask permission, or, you know, that somebody, for somebody to state that I need somebody else's permission to defend my children, my wife, and my own life is utterly insulting and ridiculous. Um, so there's that. Uh, but look into the Second Amendment itself, and especially the, you know, the things that uh, people at the time were writing about it, uh, not only the sort of proto-libertarian people like Jefferson, which, you know, it could be, could be claimed that Jefferson was sort of libertarian, um, but even the more statist element among the um, founding generation, people like Madison and Washington, they were very explicit in their writings about the Second Amendment. The idea behind it was to make sure that the population of the United States uh, vastly outguns the government and its army. Let that sink in for a second. Again, the idea was for the population, for the people, to vastly outgun the government so that the government is never even tempted at all to turn the bayonets and the rifles of their soldiers against the people. The idea was to make that suicidal and hopeless. And that is a very powerful check on the eternal ambition of the government to expand its power at the expense of the population's liberties. That's a very important idea, isn't it? It's, again, forget hunting, forget even the personal self-defense against private crime. It was the self-defense against the government. That was the idea behind the Second Amendment. Um, and I find that to be very unique. I don't know any other country who has that, that has that uh, history. Even the countries that have gun ownership and gun rights to some extent, even something like Switzerland, um, if you know anything about the actual gun culture, not the gun laws necessarily, and not the gun laws per se, but the gun culture in Switzerland, please share. I'd love to learn more about it. But my understanding is that uh, for centuries the Swiss have lived uh, in a state of perpetual uh, threat of conflict, and therefore the at least the male population was sort of, you know, you know, an army reserve in a way. And, you know, the Swiss males are required to serve in the army and they keep a firearm, a SIG rifle, automatic rifle, in their homes with, you know, with ammunition and all that. But they are the Minutemen. They are citizen soldiers. So that should there be a threat of invasion, they could be mobilized at, a mo uh, mobilized at the moment it's noticed and turn into an army. And the entire population could be turned into an army uh, in a matter of minutes or, or hours. That seems to be, at least you know, based on the limited information that I have, uh, the idea and the thrust behind the gun situation in Switzerland. If you have more information, please share it with me. I, I, I really appreciate being educated on that subject. Uh, but that's different from the Second Amendment here in the U.S., isn't it? I mean, <laughs> to explicitly state... And it doesn't say so in the Constitution, but the writings, again, the writings of the, of the early 19th century of some of the founding fathers clearly, explicitly talk about it, about the Second Amendment being a check on the government, uh, a very powerful check in the hands of the people. Uh, <laughs> that's, you know, of course, that idea is pretty much gone from the public discourse and from the public mind, but it's there. It's there. That was what was thought and said and written at the time. Again, even by statists like Washington and Madison. Uh, but the other thing that makes the Second Amendment so curious, in my mind, I think, is this. Look, if I, if I wanted to be a tyrant, right? if I wanted to set up a system where I could keep a large population of people for generations and generations and generations under my control and to be able to live at their expense... You know, if I, if I was smart, 
I would set it up so that the people have the have some liberties or illusions of liberties, you know, convincing illusions of liberties in areas that are, let's say, not very important to me as a tyrant. You know, things like I don't know, presumption of innocence and adversarial, you know, judicial system and you know, ju you know trial by the jury of your peers and all those other things, right? You know. That gives you uh, a sense of protection from arbitrary power. Um, however, in a couple of very important aspects, I would set up things quite differently. And the number one aspect would be money, because that's what it's all about. Uh, because again, my, my point would be to try and live at the expense of the population without them knowing it, and at least with, with them consenting to it or acquiescing to it. And consent doesn't have to be enthusiastic. It can be, you know, passive resignation in, you know, along the lines of, oh, well, death and taxes, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, nevertheless, the, uh, uh, my goal would be to, to have a system where people acquiesce con you know, continuously to what I'm doing to them, namely to me taking their stuff. Um, I would set up, uh, you know, an ideology to convince people that it was totally legitimate and, in fact, good and moral for them to give me their stuff. Uh, because I was their benefactor and I was their protector and whatnot, and of course states have always done that, and the United States government is no different, and no exception to that rule. But again, in the area of money, namely taxes, I would set things up quite differently. There would be no laws, there would be there would be no rights, there would be no liberties there. And if you look at how the IRS operates and the laws that regulate taxation in the United States, that's exactly how things are. There's no presumption of innocence with the IRS, for example. If they say that you owe them X amount of dollars, you're not presumed to not owe them that. You're actually presumed to owe them exactly what they say, and it's the burden of proof is on you to defend your money from them. They have the first claim. And when you do go ahead and try and defend yourself and protect your property from them, where do you go? Do you go to a normal court? No. <laughs> you go to the IRS court. And they don't even follow their own rules and their own laws that they've passed. Uh, in fact, the U.S. Code does not contain, you know, the, there is no law on the books in the United States that explicitly says that you have to pay the income tax, for example. I, I bet you didn't know that, but that's, that's exactly what it is. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that when you're dragged in front of a court that you will not be convicted. Uh, juries and judges will convict you, you know, in the vast majority of cases, even though you're technically not breaking any laws if you do not pay your income tax. Again, that's the, that's, you know, the, the fact to the extent that I was able to establish it. If you don't pay your income, if you don't, you don't file your income tax, you're technically not breaking any laws, and yet they will convict you and they, they will put you in jail. Uh, as many people like Larkin Rose and Erwin Schiff, Peter Schiff's father, have found out, but they do not follow their own rules. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Rules do not exist when it comes to money. Money is too important to have any rules or any liberties for you guys. Um, so um, all those things, protections, rights, and all that, they all go out the window. Um, and yet people still acquiesce, right? But the other important area in which I would have no rights and no liberties would be firearms, would be weapons. Because that's how laws are enforced. L laws are enforced at the point of a gun. And... You know, if I was a smart tyrant, I would definitely make sure that my subjects have no physical means to resist. Now, at the time of the Second Amendment, the population owned the same grade of weaponry that the regular army did. Now, I'm not talking about cannons or, or you know, men of war, like warships or anything like that, but I'm talking about fire, personal firearms, rifles. Uh, uh, the population owned... Uh, a very large number of the most advanced rifles at the time. They were basically on par, armed on par with the regular army. Today that would mean that, you know, uh, the civilian population should be allowed to have machine guns and the true assault weapons, um, sniper rifles, any calibers, anything that the army has. That was the situation back then. Okay? Um, and that was, again, if you look into the idea behind the Second Amendment, that's exactly the idea. You have to be, uh, you know, you, you want your population to, 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 to have the same weaponry as your army, only much more of it. Um, 
And that's why I think the U.S. is so curious, because for some reason, they, they let that one slip through. And there is a very strong gun culture in the U.S., and people feel very strongly about owning firearms. Now, most of the people talk about self-protection, uh, um, you know, pr protecting their lives and their property and their loved ones with the firearms, and that's sort of the thrust uh, of a lot of the uh, gun rights uh, rhetoric and, uh, you know, pe things that people say and laws people lobby for and all that stuff. Uh, not so much about uh, protection against the government. Uh, you know, so, so the rhetoric has changed. And again, the idea of, uh, you know, population being armed to stand guard against uh, the pretensions of their own government is pretty much gone from the public discourse and from the public mind, which is very regrettable. That, you know, it's been gone from it for a while. Uh, but I don't know any other country that has the same... Uh, you know, degree of proliferation of firearms. Uh, like I said before, you know, even Switzerland is a distant second, uh, let alone other countries like, you know, Germany and Finland, stuff like that. Uh, they don't even come close in terms of gun ownership to the United States. Uh, and that, I think that's, a, that's an error that the U.S. government uh, has allowed to take place. Um, but I don't think, I, you know, I don't think that can be easily dealt with by the government uh, right now. You know, we've all witnessed many attempts, legislative attempts, to regulate firearms, you know, more stringently, and they seem to keep failing. Um, that's, I think, something that makes the U.S. pretty unique and interesting. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the people actually have the physical means to resist en masse if they wanted to, not that they're going to want to, you know, the, the, the vast majority of people, 99.99% of, of gun owners are statists anyway, and they, they you know, they, they see no problem in obeying their government. But still, isn't it curious that one of the two most important things that any group that wants to control a country, uh, you know, continuously on a, on a, on a long-term basis needs to take care of weapons and money one of those has slipped through and the weapons are not quite uh, under the government's control in this country I would have done it differently <laughs> I think the only reason they didn't do it differently is because they couldn't I guess you know kind of like I think that the only reason they're not going for an outright ban of all firearms is because they 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 think they they can't get it if they thought they could get it they would go for it they're not even going for it. They're they're trying to ban rifles, right? And that's very interesting because even you know, I'm, uh, you you guys know this obviously, but you know, uh, what is it? Three percent of the crimes, or three percent of the murders committed with firearms are committed with with uh, semi-automatic rifles, right? And they still are going after semi-automatic rifles and not handguns that that are responsible for the for the vast majority of gun deaths in the United States every year. And they will even admit that openly. They know that if they ban rifles, they're not going to even make a, a you know a, a noticeable dent in the death statistics. But that's not why they're doing it. Rifles are effective because you can engage your targets at range with rifles, and rifles are an effective means of you know for the population to resist local police and local enforcement efforts. Of course, if they you know they send helicopter gunships and uh, you know uh, like army rangers against one farmer or whatever, you know. Yeah, that's hopeless, sure. But en masse, en masse, dedicated uh, individuals armed with rifles can actually put up quite a bit of resistance against local enforcement efforts. You know? Uh, so rifles are pretty important in that regard, and I think that's why exactly why they're going after them. But um, they're not going after handguns. And they, they can't even, you know, they can't even take care of the rifle business either, right? Um, so the, the only reason they're not going for it I think is because they can't get it now they, they will try to go for it again and again and again until they get it if, you know, if they're able uh, for example one thing that I, I never thought about but uh, Lengthy and Arthur one of my uh, you know one of the people I'm subscribed to and one of the people that you should absolutely go listen to uh, here on YouTube uh, he has the most comprehensive collection of gun rights videos that you will ever find he's one of the most uh, informed uh, individuals on YouTube on that subject, and you will be greatly educated if you listen to his content. Uh, but he pointed uh, in one of his recent videos, he pointed this thing out that uh, you know, 
if the goal of the NICS check, which is, you know, if you've ever tried to buy a firearm in the United States, you know what it is. It's a phone call to the FBI. Uh, it's not a fax to the FBI. Fax. We're still sending faxes. It's 2013, okay? But anyway, so you, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a check. Uh, it's a background check performed by, by the FBI to make sure that you're not a felon or something. Well, if the purpose of that check was to make sure that uh, no uh, forbidden persons come into possession of a firearm through a firearms dealer... AKA, you know, you know, no forbidden person can, can, you know, can actually buy a firearm in a gun gun store. Then why do they require the serial number of the weapon in question? Now I go in and I try to buy a rifle or a pistol. The next check actually includes all of my information, my social security number, my name, blah blah blah. You know, co- you know, eye color, head color, hair color, height, weight, whatever, and the serial number of the gun I'm buying. Well, if if the if the only purpose is to establish that I'm not a felon, I'm not banned by law from possessing a firearm, why do they need the serial number of the actual gun I'm buying? They don't, okay? The only reason they're, they're, they're asking for it is because they, they will keep that number with my name in the database. Now, they're forbidden by law from doing it, but they are doing it. We all know they're doing it. They have that database. They want to know what gun is owned by whom and where it is at all times. They can't. They don't know about every single firearm in the country, of course, but they want to know as much as possible. So that should they decide to do anything to, you know, person X, they will look up in their database and say, oh, he's bought these three firearms, so he's likely to have, you know, a rifle, a shotgun, and a handgun in his house when we go to arrest him. So we'll put together two SWAT teams instead of one, or something like that. So they will always be, you know, continually going for it as much as they can until they succeed, um, or until everything falls apart. Uh, But the reason they're not going for an outright ban right now is because they don't think they can get it. They don't want to find out what happens if they try to go for the big prize, to go for the jugular, you know, outright. Uh, it's not going to be pretty, and they know that the outcome is unknown, and therefore they're not trying it uh, blatantly, as blatantly as that. So they're, they're doing everything else in the background to make sure that, they, you know, someday they can succeed at disarming their population entirely, but right now it's not feasible in the United States. And that is very hopeful. I think it's 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 more than just interesting. It's it's actually hopeful and uh, important. Ah, oh, it's too cold. My lighter's not working. Oh my gosh. It's uh, it's important. That uh, they you know they they didn't take care of that one little thing. Um, anyway, let me know what you think about this whole paradigm. Um, I'll, I always appreciate your thoughts. And if again, if, if somebody can point me in the right direction to read about or, you know, otherwise find out about the gun culture in the in Switzerland, uh, I'll appreciate that a great deal. All right, that's it.